write the equation of the tangent line to the curve f of x equals 3 divided by 1 plus x squared at the point 1 comma 3 halves. And we are actually going to do this problem twice, showing how we can use both of our different formulas for finding the slope of the tangent line. So remember, if we're trying to write the equation for a line, we need a point and we need a slope. We have the point, so we have to do some work to find the slope. Now, the x-coordinate of the point where we want to find the slope, that's what we're labeling as a. Remember, the y-value essentially is f of a. In this case, our y-value is equivalent to f of 1. So let's go ahead and rewrite our limit statement. And let's go ahead and put in the value of a. So the limit as h approaches 0 of f of 1 plus h, since a is equal to 1, minus f of 1, all divided by h, is our initial setup. Now we can go ahead and use our function that we've been given here, 3 divided by 1 plus x squared, and we can actually evaluate f of 1 plus h. So we have the limit as h approaches 0. Now, when we evaluate f of 1 plus h, remember, we're going to our function f of x here, and we're essentially substituting, in place of x, we're substituting 1 plus h. So I actually drew my division bar too early because I need some more room. So this is going to be 3 divided by 1 plus the quantity 1 plus h squared. That's the value of f of 1 plus h. Okay, next we have minus f of 1. So we could actually plug 1 into our function, but remember, that's actually already been done for us. If we substitute 1 into our function, we will end up with 3 over 2, 3 halves. So we're going to subtract 3 halves. And then this is all divided by h. So this looks pretty complicated. This is called a complex fraction. So we have to now basically quit on our calculus for a second, time out with the calculus, and commit to doing a decent amount of algebra right now. Because we ultimately want to be able to do direct substitution, and we cannot do direct substitution with h in the denominator because we would get division by 0. So we're going to need to get a common denominator and actually subtract these fractions that we have in the numerator. So I am looking for a common denominator basically between this quantity 1 plus 1 plus h squared and 2. So I am going to need to multiply my first fraction by 2 over 2. So this entire denominator will get multiplied by 2. And my second fraction will have to be multiplied by 1 plus the quantity 1 plus h squared in the numerator and the denominator, like so. So let's go ahead and work on this algebra. 2 times 3 is going to be 6 minus, then we'll have 3 times this quantity, I'm going to use some brackets so I avoid doing double parentheses, 1 plus 1 plus h squared, all divided by that common denominator, which will be 2, times the quantity 1 plus 1 plus h squared. And then this is all still divided by h. Now at this point, if you are tired of writing this as a complex fraction, I would encourage you then, instead of writing this division here by h, remember, if we are dividing by h, that would be the same as then multiplying by the reciprocal, which would be 1 over h. So if you want to go ahead and change this so that you're not dividing by h here, at this step, and you could do this at any time, if you want to change this to then multiplying by 1 over h, because it looks cleaner and it's going to take up less space, that would be completely fine. So now, more algebra. The limit as h approaches 0. So we are going to need to go ahead and multiply out this 1 plus h squared inside that bracket. And then we'll also need to 
distribute some more and combine like terms. Let me help you with that because sometimes it's the algebra that really trips people up more than the actual calculus. 1 plus h, the quantity squared, will be 1 plus 2h plus h squared. Now, the denominator, I encourage you, leave it as it is. We don't want to bother expanding and distributing this denominator because ultimately, remember, our goal is to be able to divide out the h in the denominator. So there is no need to simplify the denominator. We really just need to simplify the numerator. So in the numerator, in the brackets, I see that I have a 1 plus 1, so that's really going to end up being 2. And then we can go ahead and distribute this 3 into everything in the brackets. So we're getting closer. The limit as h approaches 0 is equal to 6. Distributing 3 times 2 is going to be 6, so we'll have 6 minus 6. Then we're distributing, I'm keeping the negative, by the way, here. I'm treating that subtraction as a negative 3. So distributing negative 3 times 2h is a minus 6h, and this negative 3 times h squared is a minus 3h squared. Denominator, I'm going to keep the way it is, and then I'm multiplying by 1 over h still. So let's simplify. The 6s will subtract out. And then notice what you have left here in this numerator, negative 6h minus 3h squared. You have a common factor there, so you actually can factor out an h. So we'll have the limit as h approaches 0. Let's factor out an h. Now there actually is a common factor of a negative 3h. I'm not going to bother factoring out that negative 3, though, because I'm really only interested in dividing out this h. So I'm just going to factor out the h. That will give me h times the quantity negative 6 minus 3h, all divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus 1 plus h squared, all times 1 over h. And finally, we're at the point where we can divide out this h in the numerator with this h in the denominator. This leaves us with the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 6 minus 3h all divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus 1 plus h squared which is great because now we're at the point where we can do direct substitution and substitute zero in place of h. So that will leave us with negative six minus three times zero, all divided by two times the quantity one plus one plus zero squared. So ultimately we have negative six divided by 4, which will simplify to negative 3 halves. Ooh, you made it. Okay, so that one is pretty heavy with the algebra. But what did we actually find? What's the meaning of this value, negative 3 halves? Remember, that's the slope of the tangent line. The slope is negative 3 halves at the point 1, 3 halves. So that's not the answer to the question. If I go back to the top, remember, the question was asking us for the equation of the tangent line. So we have to actually write the equation for a line. This is where we go back and need to use the point that we were given. And that point was 1, 3 halves. So using the point 1, 3 halves, I prefer to use point-slope form. So using point-slope, the equation for the tangent line and it's up to your instructor whether they're going to allow you to use point slope or not I do that would be y minus 3 halves is equal to the slope negative 3 halves times the quantity x minus 1 and if you're a student of mine I would let you leave it like this I think this looks great now, if you're a person who has an instructor that really wants that answer to be in slope intercept form, then you could easily distribute here and combine like terms. So I'll show that just in case, because a lot of textbooks will leave the answer in slope intercept form. So that would give us negative 3 halves x plus 3 halves. 
And then if we add 3 halves to both sides, we'd have y equals negative 3 halves x plus 6 halves, which is really 3. So this would be the equivalent slope-intercept form. These are equivalent equations, so they're both great answers. Now let's move on to the other way of doing this so that you can make a decision regarding which formula you like better when you're trying to find the slope of the tangent line. So now we're going to be using the limit as x approaches a. And remember again that in this case a is equal to 1. So let's go ahead and substitute that in. The slope of the tangent also can be found by computing the limit as x approaches 1, that's my value for a, of f of x minus f of 1, all divided by x minus 1. Now let's go ahead and input our function. So the limit as x approaches 1, our function f of x was given to us. That's up here, 3 divided by 1 plus x squared. And then f of 1, remember, we would substitute 1 into this function. But if you go ahead and substitute 1 into the function, you realize that you were actually given f of 1. It's the y value here of this coordinate. So that actually was already done for you. You don't actually have to do the work for that all divided by x minus 1. So this looks algebraically a little bit simpler than what we did earlier up on part A. You might prefer this because now we still have to get a common denominator because we cannot do direct substitution and plug in 1 because we would have division by 0. But it looks algebraically a little bit more clean. So to get a common denominator, I'm going to multiply this first fraction by 2 over 2 and my second fraction by 1 plus x squared divided by 1 plus x squared. So this will give us the limit as x approaches 1. 2 times 3 here is 6 minus 3 times 1 plus x squared, all divided by that common denominator, which will be 2 times 1 plus x squared. And then this entire thing will get divided by x minus 1. Now, on my second step down here, or rather my third step, I am going to stop writing this division again, dividing by x minus 1. So just like I did on part A, instead of writing division by x minus 1, I'm going to write it as multiplying by the reciprocal of x minus 1 which would be 1 over x minus 1. So I have 6, let's go ahead and distribute, minus 3 minus 3x squared divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus x squared. Remember, I am not going to distribute in this denominator. And then I'm going to change the division by x minus 1 to multiplication by the reciprocal. So that'll be 1 over x minus 1. I just think that's a much cleaner way of writing this. Keep simplifying. 6 minus 3 will be 3. So we have 3 minus 3x squared, all divided by 2 times 1 plus x squared times 1 over x minus 1. Now, our goal, again, is to be able to do direct substitution. And we cannot do direct substitution because we still have this x minus 1 in the denominator. So we're really hoping that we can factor the numerator here and hopefully we'll end up with an x minus 1 so that we can simplify. And sure enough, if you factor out a greatest common factor from the numerator, let's see what happens. 3 minus 3x squared has a common factor of a 3. So if you factor out that 3, you'll be left with the quantity 1 minus x squared. And that may not look so good yet, but if you keep looking, 1 minus x squared is a difference of perfect squares. So you can factor that piece further. So let's factor that using difference of perfect squares. 
which gives us the limit as x approaches 1 of 3 times 1 minus x times 1 plus x, still divided by 2 times 1 plus x squared, all times 1 over x minus 1. Now, we were really hopeful that this x minus 1 would divide out, but if you look at both of these factors in the numerator here, neither one of those is x minus 1. However, the factor 1 minus x, that is very close because if I reorder that, 1 minus x is the same as negative x plus 1, and if I factor out a negative 1 from that, I end up with negative 1 times the quantity x minus 1. And then I'll have that x minus 1 that I want. So I have to recognize that this 1 minus x factor, I can reorder that and I can factor out a negative 1 from that. So I showed you that algebra off to the side so that I don't have to put it here. So by factoring out the negative, we'll end up with a negative 3 then that quantity will become x minus 1 times 1 plus x divided by 2 times 1 plus x squared times 1 over x minus 1. Finally, we can divide out these x minus 1s, and now we have a limit that we can use direct substitution on. The limit as x approaches 1 of negative 3 times the quantity 1 plus x divided by 2 times the quantity 1 plus x squared. Finally, let's use a little direct substitution. We're going to substitute 1 in for x. So negative 3 times 1 plus 1 divided by 2 times 1 plus 1 squared. In other words, negative 3 times 2 is going to give us negative 6 in the numerator, and the denominator will be 4. And voila, fabulous. We get negative 3 halves, which we were hoping to get. And remember, that's the slope of your tangent line. So once again, to finish this off and write the equation for the tangent line, we would use point-slope form. So y minus the y value of our coordinate is equal to our slope, negative 3 halves, times x minus the x value of our coordinate, so that we actually answer the question fully. So now you've seen both methods back to back. They are both algebraically intensive. Don't get me wrong. The good news, as we learn a little bit more calculus, very, very soon we will learn a shortcut for this eventually. We're just not quite there yet. We don't have all that knowledge, all those pieces. So right now you do have to make the decision regarding which formula you want to use to find the slope of the tangent line. They will both get you the correct answer.